Hey, everybody. Uh, so glad that you are tuning into this video. Um, I'm Jay, as you know, and uh, here with my dear friend Dave Tish, our teaching pastor over at South Hills. And uh, Dave also does 48 other things on our staff, <laughs> uh, shaping our teaching culture and going to lunch with me when I ask him because I get lonely and he's my friend. Um <laughs> But Dave and I are so excited because uh, today now, I'm not the been... I'm not the guest of honor here, Jay. Oh no, <laughs> oh no, we we're excited. That's right, we're we're so pumped because uh, we've been telling you as we've been in this series called the Unseen, what the Bible says about the supernatural. We, we've said from the get go that there is just too much. There's too much wild stuff that's really important um, to be able to preach on in a 35 40 minute sermon so uh, we told you that we would be spending some time chatting with um, the legend himself dr gary brashears and so that's what you're watching right now uh, for those of you who are not familiar dr brashears is a professor at western seminary was the chair of the department uh, for biblical and theological studies for many years um, he's a preaching elder at grace uh, church in gresham oregon he's the author of several books and maybe most importantly if you don't know gary he is a pastor to pastors he has been a pastor to me to Dave. He's been a pastor to pastors that you've read, names like John Mark Comer or Tim Mackey at the Bible Project. Gary was actually on the board of the Bible Project for many years. And um, he is one of the brightest theological minds I've ever known. And at the same time, uh, this is very rare for a high level, uh, world class academic to also be truly pastoral. And that is what Gary is so dr gary brashears thank you so much for joining us today you forgot something really important jay okay really what important I i'm a happy grandfather oh. ah yes this is true in, the, for, in the foreseeable father. future to be a happy great grandfather oh my goodness not I not your future i've got exciting. two granddaughters that are like this with the guys yeah so. okay Look I thought out. you were oh going to say uh, he, he also was the uh, the impetus behind uh, the book we used last fall. Um, Dr. Brashears was um, yep. his, it was his material we turned into the Abraham series. So yeah, that's, that's right. great. But, I love that. Then again, double yeah. grandfather is probably a, a more, import, <laughs> more important topic yeah. for sure. Yeah. So awesome. one of the things we wanted to we're just going to kick off and we're just going to let you talk, uh, Gary. One of the first things I think I, I counter because I was in your cohort at Western Seminary. And one of the first times we ever met, I remember we were out at Costa Mesa. Somebody had planned a dinner for all of us to come together. It was at a vegan restaurant, which was tragic. <laughs> it was really, it was really good, actually. All I, I didn't pick it. Just to be clear, I didn't pick it. Somebody yeah. else did, and yeah. and they never were allowed to pick the restaurant for the rest of the time. Um, but we're there, and right before the meal, I mean, we're just talking and getting to know each other, everything. And you had mentioned that. Um, you said, let's just stop and pray because you just gotten an email from somebody. It was a ministry partner, someone you knew that worked in Africa, and they had some sort of um, kind of uh, some sort of ministry there. And there were some rebels advancing on their position. And you said, this is a spiritual attack. We need to start <laughs> start praying against these dark forces. Now, I, I was like, wait, what? Now, obviously, I would have said, oh, yeah, that's evil. But I would have said something like, there's some bad people about to do some bad stuff. I would have probably materialized it, you know? Why is it so important for us Christians to live with kind of an awareness of the supernatural dimension of evil? Um, and even as you talked about it, it felt jarring. It was like, wait, how is he talking about this this bunch of rebels that have machine guns that feels physical, not spiritual? So why is it so important for Christians to live in that reality? And, um, you know, to have an understanding of that. I, I don't remember who it was, a uh, pastor, a friend of mine, uh, said, if you live next door to a dragon, you probably should pay attention to it. Mm. And we live next door to a dragon. Uh, his, his, I mean, there isn't a name, it's only titles for him, but Satan, dragon, uh, devil, uh, we actually don't know his name and that's okay. May his name ever be forgotten because he's a bad guy, mm. but we do live next door to a dragon, the serpent. And from the very beginning, Genesis chapter three, and I think it's actually before Genesis one, one, 
uh, God and the serpent are in a battle for good and, and bad. And we were created in a war zone. I think in Genesis chapter one, humans were created to be blessed, image bearing covenant partners with the Lord of glory to overcome the dragon, overcome the serpent, overcome the chaos monster, what do you want to call him? And his minions, to use a popular title. Uh, uh, and the way we overcome them is by doing good, by doing communities of faithfulness, love, justice, beauty, etc. cetera. Uh, but we are in a war. Paul puts it this way in Ephesians 6. He says, we battle not flesh and blood, but against spiritual powers of darkness. He's got a number of names there. So in that particular episode, uh, it was a place that's it, in Democratic Republic of Congo, East Congo. Uh, it is indeed a spiritual battle going on there. And these are people who are humans who have been taken captive by the evil one to do his will. And they were, being, they were attacking because the people are attacking specifically were Christians and doing the good that they were opposed to. And they were coming in, in the name of Satan against people living in the name of Jesus. Mm. But I do believe that behind the curtain, so to speak, there are spiritual powers. It's referred to all through scripture. And we here in the West being thoroughly trained in secular materialism simply do not believe, do not see the spiritual realities. In fact, we don't really believe in God either, for that matter, uh, many mm. of us, which is really ironic. Yeah. Yeah. That's helpful. We, yeah. During week one of this series, we touched on the challenge of materialism and yeah. we live in, in a world yeah. Yeah. in which if it's not physical, if you can't measure it or weigh yeah. it, then it must not be real. That's correct. And yeah, I think what you just said is so important that uh, we live aware. Otherwise, if you, if you walk to a war zone, holding a beach towel and frisbees you're ill-equipped you know to to navigate yeah, that yeah. war zone um i want to ask you uh we're going to get into all sorts of specifics here gary okay. about the devil and angels and demons yep. and all of that but i want to ask you maybe like a high level question and uh this this is one of the few questions we're going to ask that maybe isn't on uh, the front of the mind, you know, it's it's not top of mind for most of our people because because most people are unfamiliar, but it is really helpful and important and challenging. Um, when most people, mo a lot of people who go to church or have read the Bible, they're familiar with the Tower of Babel story, right? Uh, uh -huh. And we think of it as kind of a simple story. These people build this giant tower, and then they have a bunch of languages and they disperse. But actually, a lot of scholars uh, make a connection, and you actually um, uh, agree with this sort of view of that story, that the Tower of Babel story actually has very strong correlations and connections to the spiritual realm and maybe, mm -hmm. you know, what, what Paul says in Ephesians 6 about the, yep. the powers of this dark world, you know. And um, so talk to us about that connection. Yep. What do you yep. think is happening at the Tower of Babel? And then what's the fallout of this dispersal of people uh, uh, at the Tower of Babel? Yeah. Well, if I can share my screen here for a minute, because yeah. I believe in looking at the Bible. I, <laughs> it's talking about the people have, uh, they have bricks for stone. They have bitumen for mortar. They've got technological advance. They've got the iPhone 23 and they go to work with it. <laughs> yeah. So to speak. Let us build ourselves a city and a tower to the top of the heavens. Let's say, let us get our own access to heaven. Yeah. Let us make a name for ourselves as opposed to having the Lord's name be our name, hmm. lest we be dispersed over the face of the earth, let's stay together in unity around ourselves. And that was their agenda, was a selfish agenda. And the Lord came down and said, gosh, look at this. Uh, and he sees a riot going on. And in a riot, it's like nothing is impossible. So he says, let's disperse the riot. So it's what he does. And uh, and they are now dispersed all over the face of the earth. That's the, that's the Genesis 11 story. I think that same story is referred to in Deuteronomy 32. Hmm. And I'll give credit to Mike Heiser, who showed me this at first. This is, this is Moses' last speech to the people of Israel before they go into the land. And he hmm. begins it 
with a uh, calling the heavens and the earth, God's creation, to be the judge. And so he proclaimed to the Lord, scribes great to God, and it goes on and talks about God. Perfect, justice, faithful, just and upright. But the people are corrupt. So what will go they replay God? He is the father who created you, establish you. And then he says this, remember the days of old. So Moses is speaking this roughly 1500 BC. And he's talking about the days of old from his perspective. So that's a good while prior to 1500 BC. Years of diminutions. Uh, ask your father to show you, I'll just tell you. I think he's referring back to Genesis 11. I'll show you why. The Most High, that's Yahweh, of course, gave to the nations their inheritance. He divided mankind, fixed the borders of the peoples. That's Genesis 11. Mm. The Most High developed the nations, divided them, fixed their borders. That's the dispersal of Genesis 11. He dispersed them according to the number of the sons of God. Mm. And then it picks up. He found his own people in the desert. That's Abram, I think, Genesis 12. But he fixed the borders of people according to the number of the sons of God. And the sons of God is a way to refer to angelic beings. We find that in Job, for example. Now, I need to point out something here that's a textual issue. This is the ESV, English Standard Version. If I go to the NIV, it represents what's in the Hebrew text, and it has here the sons of Israel. Hmm. But I stop and think, now, in, in the days of old, when did Jacob's 12 sons ever rule over the nations? Right. This makes no sense. Hmm. So if you, and this is a footnote in NIV and ESV, the sons of God is not in it's not in the hebrew text but it is in the dead sea scrolls text and it's also in the septuagint the greek translation of the bible so this is an ancient textual variation and sons of god makes sense mm. uh, sons of israel makes no sense because they never ever were ruling over the nations but i'm right. suggesting to you that the sons of god were let me just show you real quickly where I see this. First Kings chapter 11. Solomon, my famous question. Good guy, bad guy? Neither. <laughs> Both. Crack, yeah, cracked from the beginning. <laughs> uh, don't enter into marriage with these other guys because they will turn your heart away after their gods. Mm. So Solomon went after Astrith, the goddess of Sidonians. Mm. And if I look today, and I, I, if I were playing with you, I'd say, okay, where do you find Sidonians today? And you both being bright would say 30 miles south of Beirut, Lebanon, the town of Sidon, uh, the port city that Jesus refers to. And that's Astrith is the god of Sidonians. Milcom mm -hmm. or Chemish is the god of Ammonites, where Ammonites, that's Amman, Jordan today. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is... Uh, and down here, you've got Chemish, the god of Moab, and Moloch, the abon of Ammonites. Moloch is a name from Milcom. See, these, mm. are, these are sons of gods, high order spiritual beings. They're associated with Ammon, Ammon, and Sidon. And Baal is associated with uh, Canaan, Baal and Astrith. So that's where you look at that. In, in that dispersal, what happened? People in ultimate arrogance said, we will not have anything to do with you, Yahweh. And he says, okay, I'll give you over to other gods of your own choice. Mm -hmm. And those are the sons of God. We might call them demonic beings, but that's actually to downgrade them a bit. They're higher order spiritual powers. And we find them today. I think of the Hindu deities, for example, Kali or Vishnu or uh, Brahma. These are high order spiritual beings in the Brahmin or in the Hindu pantheon. And we could, other religions, Native Americans, they name the gods of their tribe and such. So I think that's what we've got is Genesis 11 is talking about God dispersing the nations and giving them over to gods they choose. 
uh, because they reject him decisively and he honors their choice and turns them over. I think Romans chapter one talks about that too, where it talks about he gave them over to creation instead of the creator. Yeah. So quick to answer for a complex question. Yeah, that's fascinating. So Gary, like one of the things that I think a lot of people ask or they have questions about is, um, I thought, for example, as a, a Christian in America, I would say that most people would think that those were invented gods. They're just made up, that there's yeah. actually nothing yeah. behind them. There's no substance behind totally. them because they're inventions of man's, you know, it's like yeah. Zeus in mythology. It's all made up. You're, You're a actually, wonderful materialist. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm corrupted by modern thinking. You're <laughs> yeah. saying there's actually gods and by yeah. gods, we mean angelic beings, not Spiritual on the being. level of God, Yahweh, yeah. the creator God, certainly not, right. but created beings yeah. that are actually at work at play even yeah. now today yeah yeah so the question is even in the u.s even in uh, Portland, yes. even in san jose let me show you biblically why i believe that if i go back to exodus chapter 7 uh we know most and aaron go before pharaoh and they he says you know go forth and let my people go take your staff cast it down and may become a serpent so they did that uh throw his staff down before and it becomes a serpent. And I ask uh, powerful pastors like Jay and Dave, how many times have you turned a staff into a serpent in the past like six months? <laughs> and the answer is <laughs> a half dozen. maybe. Yeah, it's totally. <laughs> but here's the thing. When Pharaoh and the sorcerers, the magicians of Egypt, they did the same thing. They cast yeah. down their staff and it became a serpent. And this isn't just, smoke and mirrors these by the power of their gods the gods of egypt are able to turn staffs into serpents yeah uh, this and this isn't just you know, david copperfield illusions yeah this right. is a reality and yeah. the gods are really powerful and yes they are at work today the same yes. sort of thing the cause of of disorder of break of chaos and we see them actively at work in our society which leads yeah, us to I, I, Go ahead, I was going to say, I think one of the things we um, we're trying to push people toward is that exact thought that can you expand your thinking, your imagination to have room for the, uh, the unseen. Uh, and I think yeah. what you're saying is really interesting, Gary, because maybe one of the reasons why people get hung up and this will kind of lead to the question Dave's going to ask here in a moment, but one of the things that gets us really hung spirit, up. You have a prophetic spirit, Jay. You have a prophetic <laughs> spirit. This is or, good. Or a Google Doc. It's one of those two. Um, I'm either a prophet or very yeah. proficient with, you know, <laughs> Google Drive. Uh, you know, people get hung up because I grew up in the Christian church. And what right. I heard all the time is there is one true God. Right. And that's it. And I think yep. the way I interpreted that was. There is one divine being and mm -hmm. nothing else. That's correct. But if I'm hearing you correctly, Gary, what the Bible seems to make really clear to us is when the Bible talks about the one true God, it's almost talking in the language of the great theologian Ricky Bobby from Talladega Nights when he says, if you ain't first, you're last. So one true God, meaning there is one God, Yahweh, who rules and reigns right. over all. And heaven and earth. Mm -hmm. the word God gets us really messed up because we think it's Yahweh's name, but it's a descriptor. It's a title. And yeah. it, we, we map, you know, that Hebrew word Elohim, it gets mapped onto spiritual beings, essentially. Right. So when you yep. read that yep. in the Bible, what the Bible is not saying is actually there's many gods and it's pluralistic and worship them all. No, it is clear there is one true God who rules the creator of all things for sure. Yep. But then there are all sorts of spiritual beings, and that word Elohim gets used to describe them, That's correct. Right? Yeah. yeah. So Michael and Gabriel, who are on the good side, are Elohim. Yeah. On the bad side, you go ba Baal and Moloch and Chemish and Astarte and uh, all those. Uh, yeah. And those are all Elohim, because just like in English, we can use the title God for Yahweh, the triune creator of heaven and earth. Or you can use the title God for all kinds of other things. Yeah. Same thing yeah. in Hebrew or Arabic. Arabic uses the term Allah, uh, which is like El. And yeah. it can be the God or it can be Arabic Christians refer to Yahweh as Allah. 
Uh, and they also refer that to other spiritual beings, the jinn mm -hmm. and things like that. So yeah. that gets us into, I, I think, the part, and I remember when the Bible Project dropped this. This is, pro I don't know if you guys get feedback, but this was disorienting, I think, for a lot of people. And that was the the one you guys did on the Divine Council. Yeah. Um, just this idea, Psalm, Psalm 82 says that God presides in the great assembly. He yep. enters judgment among the gods, the Elohim. Yep. And that great assembly, that idea of a divine council is like God has a staff team of spiritual beings. And some of those staff, I guess, uh, revolted, um, uh, rebelled or something like that. So you want to talk a little bit about that and, <laughs> and what's what's going on there? Because yeah. the idea of God having a staff team is is with a bunch of spiritually powerful beings is maybe yeah. alien to a lot of us. Do any of you sing? Either of you sing? Jay Dave was in a, a band. Dave, Dave was a in fantastic. a band. I'm an amazing. <laughs> I was in a boy band. Oh. So yes. Yes. Did you ever sing uh, the did you ever sing that song The God of Angel Armies? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It was real popular three or four years ago. Yeah. Well that that's Psalm eighty two is yeah. angel armies is Yahweh Sabaot, the Lord of hosts, we translate it, or the God of angel armies. And that's a very common phrase in scripture. And uh, so this is Psalm 82. God has taken his place in the divine council in the midst of the Elohim. He holds judgment. And that's what we're talking about here is this divine council. This is ESV. Some NIV calls it the great assembly, uh, just how you translate the Hebrew, in the midst of the Elohim, he holds judgment. Now, a lot of people would say that's kings, but God does not take his place among human kings. That doesn't make any sense. He does judge them very negatively, but he says, you are Elohim, sons of the most high, all of you. Uh, nevertheless, like humans, you will die. Now, if the Elohim are human then like humans you will die makes no sense right if these are angelic beings sons of the most high or sons of god malak yahweh uh you sorry uh, b'nai elohim uh like humans you will die or any other prince that's what he's he's saying here these elohim these elohim will die like humans and that's what we say about the divine council mm -hmm. is among the divine council, there are good guys and bad guys. Michael, Gabriel are named good guys. There are a lot of them that don't have names. Uh, and we find the same kind of thing happening in Job uh, chapter one, uh, where God calls uh, here he the day when the sons of god there's that phrase again ben elohim came to present themselves before the lord and the devil the satan is among them and the lord and the satan have this conversation and satan ends up afflicting job and all that but the sons of god that's the divine council and in this divine council ironically are both good guys and bad guys and you say how can that be and my answer is, next time you see God, ask him, because he didn't explain it to me. <laughs> but that's is the good. idea, that, yeah, that, um, that's fast. The idea is that there's this giant cosmic drama that we're a part of, that's in correct. which the same options, will we be allegiant to God or not? Or, by God, I mean Yahweh, the creator yeah. God. Oh, yeah, wow. the best okay. analogy I can do that's familiar to all of us would be the president as compared to the U.S. Senate. Hmm. The president has a higher authority. He can veto anything the Senate does. I mean, it doesn't work out real well. Uh, but the you've got one president and you've got 100 senators and the 100 senators advise and consent on certain decisions and such. But among the Senate, there are supporters of the president and they're enemies of the president, but they're still a part of that council. That's as good an analogy we can do among the things that are familiar from our world. Yeah. Except the difference That's between a, Yahweh and the Senate is much bigger than the president versus the U.S. Senate. Right, right. That's helpful. So we've established here that there is clearly, biblically speaking, uh, a spiritual realm mm -hmm. full of spiritual beings. I want to ask you about the one yep. spiritual being that most people think about the most 
<laughs> and it's a big broad question so just give us you know the 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 big brush strokes when it comes to the devil or the satan this great yep. enemy of god the dragon the serpent you know he's got all sorts of descriptors throughout the scriptures yep. um who exactly is the devil you know what do we know about his origin story and what, and what do we don't know and uh not know and and what's his ultimate purpose who is the devil you know where did he come from and and what's he trying to do i uh, it's it's not clear that we have any origin story from the devil we get some hints i mean one of the clearest hints uh is in the ironically in the qualification for elders first timothy chapter e. It's got the various things here about what it has, what he has to be. But here down verse seven, morals, he must thought outsiders. So he may not fall into disgrace into the snare of the devil. Mm. But just before that, that so that's Satan is, a, is after elders, but it says he must not be a recent convert or may become puffed up with conceit and fall into condemnation of the devil. Now this hints that somehow the devil became puffed up with conceit and fell into condemnation. And that's the thing that happened to the devil. It's a hint. It's not a direct teaching, but the possibility is that this guardian cherub, uh, we find him in uh, another hint in Ezekiel 28. And it's just a hint. It's about the Prince of Tyre, uh, this man says, I am a God, I will do that, but you're a man, you're not an Elohim, uh, and all these things. And a little bit later, it changes things. Son of man, over the the king of Tyre, you had the signet perfection, wisdom and beauty in Eden, you're in the garden of God, and it goes on and talks about this. You are an anointed guardian cherub. I place you on the holy mountain of God in the midst of the stones of fire as you walk. You are blameless till unrighteousness is found in you. And it goes on and talks about this, the I destroyed you guardian cherub. And the idea that, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, it's only a hint, but I like what Tim Mackey suggests that this passage hints that this cherub who is carrying the Godmobile that we see in Ezekiel chapter, in the whole book of Ezekiel, this cherub wanted to be on the throne instead of carrying the throne it's only a hint but somehow this guardian cherub uh became an enemy of god when unrighteous was found. and it seems to be connected with pride and a desire to elevate myself up to the equality with god yeah uh we, we want to get into angels and demons here in a second but you you know you mentioned the possibility seems that there are some biblical hints that the devil the satan was possibly once a this cherub that fell into disgrace yeah. puffed up you know i think some people have heard stories like that that the the devil or the satan was some sort of angelic being who pride took over um and then you kind of drop this line in there from that passage about cherub so let me ask you about that we're introduced to cherubs pretty early genesis 3 after the yep. fall of yep. humans they are driven out from the garden of, uh, of eden they're driven to the east and then god uh verse 24 he places on the east side of the garden right. of eden cherubim and a, and a yep. flaming sword uh okay so most people are probably wondering like gary what's a cherub so uh tell us about that what is a cherub <laughs> yeah, i think about hallmark and and babies in diapers just so well you're clear. Uh, that's repent, what i think of. brother repent <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah and that, of course, is mocking. Uh, we don't know a lot about the heavenly orders, but we have uh, seraphim and cherubim. A, a seraph is a flaming one. A cherub is some sort of guardian. And you find in Ephesians chapter 6, you find other categories of spiritual beings. We don't know much about them, except there are quite a few of them. And apparently, a cherub would be the way you'd say in Hebrew, uh, is a very high, powerful angel, angelic being. Uh, that God uses in certain kinds of ways, uh, but we just don't know much about them. Seraphim mm -hmm. we see in Ezekiel, or Isaiah chapter 6, uh, and this apparently is a higher order being that's close and works with the, uh, with the Lord himself. 
But yeah. again, we have so little data, but man, people quickly tell you, well, let me tell you what's there. And they come up right. with speculation <laughs> or something a demon told them. Yeah. Okay. Didn't say Can I ask you about it. Seraphim though? Uh, sure. Because it does look like Seraphim are like these mashups of animals that we see in the actual created world. Is there a sense that like, I, I think about like when I've seen these, these sometimes you go to zoos or out in the wild, you see these majestic animals and they have power or strength or, and it almost feels like God's taking what he's created and mashing them together in these like, almost like guards. Yeah. Is, is that kind of, is there a reflection of God's created glory in the seraphim? Or, or am I, is that just me? Am I off? That's probably, you I mean, I know stupid. I'm off, but am yeah. I off on that? Yeah. It's probably just you being <laughs> stupid, Dave. <laughs> Wow. All uh, right. It, it, we, <laughs> a little more seriously, we do find in the Hebrew pictures in Ezekiel, uh, we find it in many other uh, religions, these pictures of myth, what we call mythological monsters that do mix up characteristics. And my inclination is to think they're actually seeing some of these angelic beings that are mashed up like that, and they are perverted glory. Mm. So I, I think what you're saying is probably true, but this, it's not something that's described specifically in scripture. It's common iconography in many different religions. And I think they're actually seeing these spiritual beings. I've mm. never seen one, but I know people who claim they have, and I actually believe them that they actually see demons and angels. And everyone I've talked to who says they see demons and angels does not want to see them. Mm. Oh, so talk about that. Let's talk about angels and demons, because I think, Jay, you were alluding oh, yeah. to it. We've got this Hasatan, this Satan, the devil. Yeah. Is he like the ringleader? Is it like the <laughs> Joker in his goons? Uh, apparently. Like, uh, like, uh, I don't know. I don't watch movies like that. So maybe. <laughs> <laughs> comic book. It's a comic book, Gary. Come on. It's, it's a Batman comic book, right? That's okay. <laughs> I grew up on the real Batman, not the perverted sure. Batman that you see around today. <laughs> Holy priceless collection of Etruscan snoods, Batman. Uh, so <laughs> let me ask you a question. What, how, do, how do you talk about angels and demons? And then you just said that people that you know who have actually seen them do, wish that they had not. Yep. So talk a little bit about that, 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 that idea. I, when you talk about angels, I mean, we've got a lot of pictures of angels. Uh, I mean, gosh, they're just about everywhere. I like Matthew chapter one. I, Matthew 1, let me get it. Uh, you get the genealogy of Jesus, and you get the birth of Jesus. And this uh, this picture, uh, Joseph, I mean, he is a righteous guy. Her husband, Joseph, being a just man, and only put her shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. He's a protector. He's going to protect his wife, or is it actually his fiance. Mary's betrothed to Jesus before they came together. So they're not married yet. She's pregnant. His righteous thing is to protect her. So he's going to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to do this. Uh, so an angel comes and bears a message to him from God, telling him, what God has in mind. And he says, don't be afraid to marry her because this is a good thing. Joseph woke up. He did just the angel commanded, took his wife and did not have uh, relations with her until after they're born. This is what angels do uh, is they carry messages and help people do good things. Another thing angels do is in, we find in revelation 19, uh, we get this angel uh, that comes down specifically, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those invited to marriage supper of the lamb. These are the true words of God. And here John falls in his feet to worship him. And the angel says, don't do that. I'm a fellow servant. Worship God only. Mm. So here are these angels and they're doing powerful things, but the important thing is they refuse to be worshipped. They recognize they're different than God. They're servants of the Lord Most High. They're not equal with God. Now, if that were uh, Satan and you wanted to worship him, he would quickly accept it. Uh, yes. And that's the temptation of Jesus is yeah. worship me and we'll do this together and it'll be great. Yeah. The demons want to steal worship that's owned only to God 
and put themselves up to draw us away from God and break that relationship with the Lord of the universe. Mm. Okay, Gary, can I ask you a question about one of the weirdest passages in the Bible, in my estimation, and that's Genesis 6. It's the moment like right after, right right around Noah, and it says that the Nephilim, like yeah. these created being, these these were on the earth in those days and also yeah. afterward, when yeah. the sons of God went to the daughters of humans and had children by them. Yep. They were heroes of old, men of renown. Yep. This is a very strange passage, and a lot of folks, this is a very strange passage. So can you talk us through passage. what you think is going on here? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of debate about the passage, what it means, but I just take it straight up. The sons of God, so that's that's the B'nai Elohim, the sons of God. That's the same exact crowd, same exact phrase that I find in Job. Uh, if I go to Job 38... Where God comes back and speaks to Job. He talks about when he laid the foundations of the earth. Where were you when the morning stars sang together when all the sons of God shouted for joy? Well, that can't be humans because they were not around when God did the initial creation. These mm -hmm. are angelic beings. And you look at an NIV, it'll translate that as angels because that's what it means. So these are sons of God, same crowd here, sons of God, saw that the daughter, these are human women, these angel beings and human women. So they took as they chose. That's the sin yes. formula. Instead of obeying yeah. God, they took as they chose and specifically go against the boundaries God does. Yeah, it's the, God, it's the Eden rhythm, right? Yep. It's the, yet they take yep. it. Yeah, that's yep. good. And then the Nephilim, which is a term meaning the what's translated in the Septuagint is giants, gigantes. So this would be Goliath, for example, is a gigantes, a Nephilim. He's a Rephidim, actually. Uh, we on the earth in those days and also afterwards when the sons of God came to the daughters of man and they bore children to them. How can angel beings and human women have children together? And I'll tell you the exact answer to that. I don't know. And nobody else does either. But this is a transgression of boundary. And God sees this wickedness. And these, if you look in the, in the literature around that talk about the sons of God in those days, not the canonical literature, because this is the only place this is talked about, uh, their, their creatures are full of violence. One of the... One of the giants we see is in Genesis 10, where it talks about Nimrod, who's one of those giants. Goliath yeah. is another one. Uh, and these are people who have self-serving self power and great wickedness. And that's what it comes up. So the question is, where are these guys today? Now, the Bible does answer that. Second Peter chapter two. Playing in the NFL, I'm assuming. Well, <laughs> yeah, some are. Yeah, I think so. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Yeah. So here in, in uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell, and actually the Tartarus there, to be kept until the judgment, and then the next thing he does, he did not spare the ancient world, but Noah, and then the Sodom and Gomorrah, these angels, it's angelos in Greek, uh, is referring back to Genesis 6. And these sons of God have been cast into Tartarus until yeah, the day of final wow. judgment. You find the same kind of thing in Jude. Uh, it, same exact kind of thing. The angels who did not stay with them on the position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, that is, they came and moved onto earth and did women, he's kept eternal darkness until the judgment of that great day. So that's what we know about the sons of God from Genesis 6. Mm. But these are angelic beings that somehow have transgressed boundaries and actually have had somehow created children with mm. human women. Yeah. Fascinating stuff. And and the point you're making there at the end, you know, God casts them because of their sin and wickedness to hell. Again, reiterate some of the point yep. that, you know, you've made earlier 
God, God rules and reigns. <laughs> right. God is in control. God is uh, the, the all powerful one. Yeah. So kind of along those lines, I want to ask a practical question that I think, you know, for Dave mm-hmm. and I as pastors, and I know for yeah. you, yeah. Gary, you've had real firsthand experience with yeah. some of this yeah. stuff. So I want to ask the question that I think a lot of Christians ask about demon possession. Mm-hmm. We've seen movies about it, all of that. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. is demon possession real? And if it is, what is it? And secondarily, can Christians be demon possessed? Who? Well, <laughs> <laughs> let me again go to the Bible. I here in Mark chapter one. Jesus has, uh, you know, he's called up some disciples, and then he goes into Capernaum and begins to teach. And when Jesus teaches, immediately in the synagogue, a man with an unclean spirit. So that's one of the names that you can have for a demon, an unclean spirit. And the unclean spirit gets ticked off when Jesus is teaching. And the demon objects. What do you have to do with Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Now, this is not a Jewish guy in a synagogue. This is a demon speaking. Can a demon control and speak through the mouth of a human? Well, here it is. That's what we call possession. Jesus rebuked him and said, and this is a good thing to say to demons, shut up, get out. And the unclean spirit convulsing, crying out loud voice came out of him. So that's a brief statement of what we might call demon possession. Uh, Yeah. Go ahead, Gary. And what I'd want to say, well, let me just leave it at that. This is a case where this Jewish man, which we don't know anything about, Uh, somehow has become overtaken by a demonic spirit, an unclean spirit, so that there's a mixture between the two. And when Jesus begins to teach, it ticks the demon off and it starts screaming at Jesus. I know who you are. Have you, and you know, and demons don't like to be looked at in the name of Jesus. It gets angry, speaks up and Jesus shut up, get out. So for the Christian That says, okay, Gary, what I have been told and hopefully what I have experienced in my life Mm -hmm. is that because I am a follower of Jesus, Mm -hmm. the spirit of God is in me and in all of us binding us as one. We, We are his temple. Can I, is it possible that I, as a Christian with the indwelling of the spirit, is it possible that I might get demon possessed that a demon might possess me in some way um is there a good answer to that question there is uh but let me it's actually it'd be a little more complex because when i come over to one of my key passages here is colossians 1 12 uh pick your translation they're all going to say pretty much the same thing we give thanks to the father and what the father has done is qualified us to share in this inheritance of the saints in light So this is the father, he, so this is the father, has delivered us. So it's a past tense. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness. That's the the kingdom of Satan. And transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. In whom we have redemption or freedom and the forgiveness of sins. So one of the things that's really important is people are in the domain of darkness, our possession, if you will, of of Satan. He's the spiritual Mm -hmm. head of the darkness. We are no longer in the domain of darkness. We are in the kingdom of his beloved son. How did we get there? Because father delivered us out of the authority of Satan and into the authority of Jesus. So what in there in in the kingdom of light we have redemption or freedom we have the forgiveness of sins I could say a lot more about that but here's the first thing I want to say is and everybody agrees with this or should is that believers are never ever under the authority of Satan in reality mm. uh, we're under the authority of Jesus 
uh, so from that perspective, uh, the devil never owns a believer. The devil does own unbelievers because they have not yet been transferred from darkness to light. We're believers. We are not the possession of the devil ever. Hmm. The trouble of it is, is that the devil can deceive us and make us think that he has authority over us. Mm. Let me hold that for just a minute. <clears throat> the term possession has three different meanings. It has ownership. And the professor in me wants to ask you guys, does the devil ever own a believer? No. No. The answer is no. Colossians 1, 12 and many others. I, there's a middle meaning, dominate. And there's another meaning, is, as we use the term possession in English. Well, what possessed you to do that? What influenced you to, you know, go out and try fentanyl or something like that? Can a demon influence a believer? Can yeah. a demon accuse or tempt? And yeah. we all say, yeah, absolutely. So can we be uh, influenced, tempted, accused, deceived? Yes, we all say yes. Can we be owned? No. The middle of the three is dominated. Uh, and that's where the debate comes in, or part mm -hmm. of it. Uh, can a Christian be dominated by a demon? And I think they can, but only as they allow it to happen mm. uh, through deception or something. It's the same thing. Uh, can a, uh, well, I, I unfortunately do too much work around domestic violence. Mm. Violent husbands who are beating the dickens out of their women. Uh, why in the world does the woman go back to the guy who's beating her up? Because somehow she's fallen into the idea that, well, I'm nice. He's so nice to me. I'm, if I just be nice, he'd be okay. But if I don't get it right, you know, he and, and they fall in this deception and they'll go back to the guy instead of calling him on 911. Mm. Well, that kind of deception is what demons can do to Christians, I think, is yeah. we can be deceived into, well, that's where the fun is. That's where the knowledge is. That's where the power is. Mm. Uh, so I think that, and I guess I, the men who are doing the abusing also deceived in a deep and dark way yeah, as well. Well, that's true. Yeah. yeah. So can a Christian be dominated by a demon? I think they can. Uh, the bigger question, and it's kind of the debate, can a demon be inside a believer? And many would say, no, 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 you can't. To my judgment, where the physical location of a spiritual being is, is irrelevant. The question is not inside, outside in a physical location. The question is authority and influence. Mm. A demon never has actual authority over a believer, no matter what you've done, unless you believe it and you give it authority, mm. but it absolutely can have influence. So a demon could be standing right beside me here and have all kinds of influence and dominating impact in my life. So whether it's inside or outside, the Bible actually doesn't answer that question. Hmm. People say, well, we're temple of the Holy Spirit. True. But in the Old Testament temple, you have demonic stuff in the temple all the time. Hmm. Hezekiah and Josiah in their reformations go in and they take demonic stuff out of the temple while Yahweh's in the Holy of Holies. In Ezekiel's vision of the corruption yep. of the temple, yep. uh, the secret places that God sees. Yep. So, yeah. yeah. So yeah. Uh, the idea that we're temple and therefore the demon cannot be inside our bodies, that analogy doesn't work. Yeah. And my answer is, I honestly don't know whether a demon can be inside a believer or not. But I don't think it makes any difference. The point is, does it have authority? The answer is no, except what I give it through being deceived. But it does have influence that I can, uh, it doesn't matter what's inside me or outside. And then people will say, can a demon actually speak through the mouth of a believer? The Bible never addresses that question specifically, but I've seen it happen. I've mm -hmm. seen people who without any doubt have Jesus as their Lord and I've I've listened to demons speak through the mouth. It happened chair right behind me here, mm. uh, one of the times. Wow, 
that's super helpful. That breakdown of the sort of trifold nature yeah. of possession yeah. is so yeah. helpful. Own, and, dominate, yeah. influence. Own, yeah. no, influence, yes, dominate. People disagree on that, but I think mm -hmm. they can if we let them have it. Yeah, that's great. That's helpful, Gary. Yeah, don't mess with demons. They're not nice. Yeah. Um. Okay, so... <laughs> Yes. Have you, you've talked about exorcisms. Have you have you done exorcisms? You've done exorcisms. Yeah. Is it I, I think about the movie The Exorcist? This is like feels like something out of a movie, right? So well, like, don't do it that talking, way. <laughs> <laughs> right. So when you talk about exorcism, is, is there is this a is is there some down to earth ways to think about this? Or because you talk about influence and being dominated. And I, I, I know lots of Christians and even moments in my own life when I've been dominated by lies. And I've, and I guess in some ways the Christian community and teachers have helped exercise those demons. Yep. Talk about exorcism a little bit, maybe mm -hmm. demystify it or talk a little bit about how you think about the word exorcism, yep. um, how it works, et cetera, et cetera. I, I mean, uh, uh, if just to give you a word, if you go to my website, brochures.net, you'll find a tab on there. It's uh, spiritual warfare resources. And I've got a bunch of stuff in there. So some of the there's documents behind some of the stuff I'm going to say here in a minute that anybody can go look at. I, I follow the pattern of Jesus pretty much. Uh, so if I go back to, I already showed it to you, Mark 1. Uh, he teaches, the demon shows up, he rebukes it, shut up, get out. I think that's a really good thing to do. Uh, Paul in Acts 16 uh, has a similar kind of passage. Uh, they're saying the Sabbath day outside this thing, place of prayer, Lydia gets saved. Oops, sorry, that's wrong one. Uh, they, uh, uh, they're going to the place of prayer. There's a slave girl who had a spirit of divination. And brought our owners much gain by fortune telling. Can a demon tell the future? And the answer is, well, Bible thinks they can. Not in every way, perhaps, but the people are making, they're making money. She followed Paul and cried out, these are servants of the most God to proclaim you a way of salvation. Paul finally gets really annoyed at her doing this and turns and said to the spirit, that's the demonic spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. And I think this is the heart of it is to have somebody uh, command the demon to come out or get away. And I think that's the heart of it. So I think the best exorcist in the scripture is a guy named Jesus. And when he gets attacked by the devil command these stones to become bread, Jesus quotes scripture out loud to the devil, standing firm on the truth of God, but he speaks scripture to the devil to stand firm on the truth. The devil does not give up. The devil's quote scripture, misuses it to be sure. Jesus, again, quotes scripture out loud to the devil, that's the sword of the spirit. The devil keeps coming. Uh, and he, third time, quote scripture out loud to the devil, stand firm on the truth of God instead of trusting my own judgment. And then the th other thing he does is Jesus said to the devil, get away. And the devil left him. So the base things of exorcism is speaking scripture out loud to the demon and commanding get away again i think out loud mm. so when i do uh i don't like the term exorcism but on how and, and i i believe that uh people have the authority to drive demons i uh, i partner together with people and i try to get uh, the person who's the believer who's being influenced or attached or whatever to a demon, deceived by a demon, first of all, to recognize truth, 
And the truth is, I'm a child of the Lord Most High. I'm seated with Jesus in the heavenlies. I'm in the kingdom of light, not in the dominion of darkness. I do a lot of scripture work to help them believe the truth that that demon actually has no authority over me. And I can follow the pattern of Jesus and deal with it. Then I help them speak scripture to the demon. I want to have them do their own spiritual work where I can, and I help them. So speak scripture to the demon and then tell the demon in Jesus' name, get away. And it actually has to go. Mm. And I help them do that. I've done that uh, a lot of times with different people. There yeah. are some times when people are so bound up, they can't do it themselves. And then I, I command the demon. But I always try to help people strengthen and realize they have the authority to say no to a demon, get away from me, just like Jesus does. We have that same authority, and I want to help them be able to do that. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that instills again, you know, usually we live with so much fear when we think about yep. um, yep. demons and the devil, and a lot of it's just driven by the the sort of cultural caricatures. That's but correct. It's a great reminder. They, in, you know, the devil's nature, <laughs> he's the father of lies. Yep. Lying is his native language. Yep. So even that is a lie, the fear, the, the sense that, Oh no, you know, it's uh, the devil's out to get me and I'm ruined. Mm -hmm. If you are in Christ, those are all lies. Yeah. That's really yep. helpful. Um, I want to ask a really practical question, Gary, uh, cause this is a question that people either have or they just ignore and then um, go one way or the other. How can a person, how can a Christian know if something difficult we're going through is spiritual warfare or a product of poor decision making or just bad luck? Um, you know, are there distinguishing marks? Because I think the reason that question matters is sometimes we can over spiritualize or underemphasize mm -hmm. yeah. the yeah. spiritual nature. I don't know. Do you have any advice there? You know, how can we recognize, oh, this is the devil and his minions doing their work, or mm -hmm. it's just, I, I probably should have gotten an oil change on my car <laughs> or, and it wouldn't have broken down on the middle of the road. You know, how, yeah. I don't know. It, yeah. How, yeah. What do you think about that? I, I assume a uh, multimodal in many cases, <clears throat> the, um, the thing that I'm not happy with is a, is a parent who brings their kid in who's really rebellious and really angry and says, we cast the demon out of my kid. So it won't be, my boy will not be so rebellious. And I, the first thing I would say to that parent is it's probably more than just a demon. Can we talk about your parenting style? Mm. I don't want to talk about parenting style. I want to talk about the demon. You may be under the influence of demon right now. Mm. Uh, because it's it's many times it's multimodal. Uh, and we want to blame a demon to get rid of our own responsibility. Mm. Uh, and that, that doesn't work out. More commonly in our society is people never think of a demonic possibility. Yeah. And I want to bring in the possibility that there's a demonic voice or a demonic power behind the addictive pattern. I want to bring in the fact that there may be a demonic narcissism behind the anger and just such. Uh, that's a piece of it. And so what I do, uh, and again, there are different ways to do things, uh, is I try to help a believer. I, I do prayer work around them just to, I'm in the kingdom of light. Demons have no authority over me, that sort of thing. And then through the prayer, I just, Holy Spirit, will you show Bill, just use a name, will you show Bill what he needs to see in his inner world? Mm. And then I say, okay, Bill, will you walk with Jesus into your inner world and just see what the Holy Spirit will show you? Yeah. He may show you, may, you may hear a voice, you may see something, you may sense something, or you may sense nothing. Uh, and then I do, again, I do that prayer work. I just, demonic spirit, you have no authority here. You must release Bill. You must shut up now. Bill, I want you to walk with Jesus. I want you to look in your inner world and tell me what you see or what you hear. And I largely trust 
that if there's something demonic there, that Bill will get a picture of or a sense or something that there's some presence there that's not me. Now it's a little more complicated than that, but that's my base approach. Yeah. I and what I find sometimes is that there's a personal presence in the inner world of a human. And then I ask them to look at it and I just command in the name of Jesus, Jesus show Bill what he needs to see. Mm. And Bill, I've, I've had this happen a number of times, Bill, oh, could that be a demon that's doing that? And the answer is could be, let's check. Mm. And then I have him quote scripture, speak scripture to the demon, command it to get away in Jesus name. Uh, and that's the base approach I do. Now, some it's more complicated sometimes, but a lot of times it's that simple. You got a demonic voice that says you are a jerk. Mm. Don't ever let anybody see what's inside you. They will hate you forever. Even that voice, it makes sense to people. Mm. You're a screw up. You can't do anything. You're a fat pig. Nobody would ever love you. You know, and those kind of demonic voices, we just take, we just, they're normal. And I want to suggest the possibility that could be a, a negative introject from an angry parent. It could be just the voice of the world that says you're 50 pounds overweight, therefore nobody would ever love you or whatever the voice, that's just the world speaking, or it could be yourself. Yeah. But the demonic possibility I want to bring into the consideration of do a spiritual assessment. And yeah. uh, not infrequently, I find a, a personal presence that's pumping energy into the lies or the addictive patterns or whatever it is. Mm. Well, yeah. Demons then quote scripture at it, command it to get away, stand firm in the reality of Jesus Christ. Mm. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. That's so helpful. I think Jay and I both had situations where we've been with people who have had the same voice saying the same thing for not yep. a, not a month, not a year, but years upon years right. upon years. It's old wound. The voice of that, person so many years ago that keeps echoing in their mind accusing them making them feel terrible and i guess that brings us to i think probably what my final question jay you might have one but just in general in light of everything you've talked about in light of a spiritual realm where there's a real enemy really uh you know possessing uh, in the possessing meaning in trying to influence yep. us um, and trying to trying to dominate us and trying right. to pull us away from God, his good plan, his good design, getting us not to trust God, et cetera, et cetera. How can Christians live in confidence? Um, how can we have courage? How, uh, you know, positionally, how should we think about ourselves going forward? Mm -hmm. And uh, how can we live in, 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 I guess, in victory over over this reality yeah. that the Bible seems so clear about? I let me go back to scripture again here for a moment. One of the passages that I really want to go to as much as possible is Ephesians 5, 8. Uh, and it'll come out in different ways in different uh, translations. Let me just do the NIV. It's a little clearer there. The NIV, Ephesians 5, 8, you once were darkness. Colossians says you're in the dominion of darkness. But here's the thing. But now you are light in the Lord. That little phrase right there is so critically important. It's the last thing in the world the devil ever wants you to believe that you are light in the world. And he'll show you all kinds. You're not light. Look at this. But mm. this is God speaking. You are light in the Lord. It's not denying there's darkness in us, but you are light. Therefore, live who you are. You were darkness. You are light in the Lord not by myself, live who you are. Mm. You know, that's so central. Another one that I want people to go to is the Colossians passage, Colossians 2.12, or sorry, 1.12. I, giving joyful thanks to the Father who qualified you and shared the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. That's where we're at. For he rescued us from the dominion of darkness. We're not there anymore. We're in the kingdom of the son he loves. And there we have freedom. We have forgiveness. I keep wanting to come back to that. Uh, God's identity. I mean, it's it's in several places. Galatians chapter four. Uh, he says, you were in God's son 
uh, to redeem those under the law, I might receive adoption to sonship. Uh, sonship means right of inheritance. This isn't about masculinity. Because you are his sons, we're children of the Lord Most High, God sent the spirit of the son into our heart, the spirit who calls out Abba, Father. You're no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you're his child, God, you made an heir. And I want to have people come back and just repeat that slowly. Holy Spirit, help me see and feel and know and experience and live the truth of this. And I just have them go through on slow cadence, but make it personal. Father, you sent your the spirit of your son into my heart this spirit calls out abba father i call that out now abba father demonic spirit i reject your voice that he this father doesn't like me i receive the truth of the spirit who says you are abba father you are the father who loves me and cares for me and wants my best i am not a slave i am child of the lord most high i'm a precious son of the lord himself I am an heir of the kingdom. I am, and one more, Ephesians chapter 2. You were dead, but God made us alive in Christ. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. I am seated with Christ in the heavenly realms, far above all authority, rule, and power, the demonic spirits have no authority over me. And so this is the way I come to the confidence is slow, prayerful reading of what scripture says, preferably in concert with a couple other people can help me do that. People I trust enough, I don't have to edit. I can actually say what's in my spirit. And when that voice comes up, it contradicts what God says. I reject that voice in Jesus name. Mm. I speak scripture to it. I reject it because that's the stand firm get away and that's the spiritual battle and it's not some you know head spinning exorcism kind of thing most of it it's just rejection the lie and holy spirit drive that truth deep into my heart mm. and it's a lot so, of done through just ordinary so prayer life yeah so. Gary, it, it also reminds me, you say, speaking against uh, something you call worm theology, which is too <laughs> low of you of what yes. God has done. Yes. And what, it's almost like saying, I'm sin and I'm defined by my sin and I'll always be sin. It's uh, yeah. it's almost like overstating yeah. um, the, the work that Jesus has done. This is so encouraging and, and hope filled yeah. that we are we can be different. That God is changing and is changing us. And the yeah. other thing is, if God really is Abba Father then I can go him to him with the thing I'm most deeply ashamed about and know that he's going to gather me up and say, let's talk about it, son. Let's talk about it, daughter. Mm. And so I can be open about my trash because it's there. Yeah. And see, the world says, don't ever admit you got any trash, man. It'll be used against you. And it is in the world. Yeah. In God's world, it's, wow, let me help. Yeah. And that's where you see God's forgiveness and help. But that's where the confidence is. I'm child of the Lord most high. Yeah. And the voice that says, no, you're not. That's mm -hmm. a voice to be condemned to hell. Because that's demons. That's not God saying that. Um, that's such a good word of encouragement, Gary. That's I'm so glad our folks are s seeing and experiencing. Again, obviously, they've experienced your academic uh, depth and breadth a bit here, but that's exactly what I was talking about at the beginning. You are truly a pastor who is a brilliant theologian. And, uh, you know, it makes me think what you're talking about. It's so moving. If the spiritual realm and spiritual realities are true and constant, yep. and even though they're unseen, then the truth is the devil is a liar and lies come at us mm -hmm. in all sorts of ways. Most of the time, the devil's attacks do not look like the movies with head yeah. spinning and lightning and thunder. Most of the time they are these insidious sort of quiet whispers that we just can't shake that, that sort of right, try right. to chip away at our identity. You know, it makes me think of um, Brendan Manning has this, one of his books, it's called the furious longing of God. 
And, you know, you can argue Manning's theology. He was off on a few things for sure, but a brilliant writer yep. and yep. certainly understood at least the love of God in a, in a profound, beautiful way. At the beginning of this book, The Furious Longing of God, I'm paraphrasing him here, but he begins with this really powerful thing. He says, I'm Brennan and I'm an alcoholic. And then I left that life and went back to that life. That's a part of my story, but it's not the whole story. And then he goes, I'm Brennan. I was once married. I'm no longer married. It's a part of my story, but it's not the whole story. I'm Brennan. I was a priest. I'm no longer a priest. That's a part of my story. It's not the whole story. He just goes on and on and on. And then at the end, he says something along the lines of, I'm Brennan. I'm a sinner saved by grace, loved and wrapped up in the furious love of God, my Abba Father. And um, that's really the center of who I am. And it makes me think of that. There are yeah. all these lies of demons and the devil telling us who we are. But in reality, like you said, like the scriptures say, we are light now and we are children. Definitely, and yeah. in that, we can have courage and confidence to to move about our lives, knowing that we are beloved by God. Yeah. And, and so I'd like to correct him. Brennan's thing one step. Instead, I'm a sinner wrapped up in God's love. I don't want to say I'm a child of God who struggles with sin. Yes, that's right. And I, I can take that struggle to my Abba and he will help me. Yeah, beautiful. Well, Gary, you are a gift to Dave, to me, <laughs> to so many. I count you as precious friends, leaders. both of you. I hate to say it about Dave, but it's true. <laughs> you know, we've done a lot together over the years, and thank you guys for being faithful pastors. I love working with you. Oh, uh, thanks so much, Gary. Thank you all for watching. We hope this was helpful to you. And uh, yeah, Gary's got a bunch of resources on his website. We'll link it on our page as well, but brochures.net, yep. and you can find some stuff there as well. So thank you guys for watching, listening, and uh, we'll see you all real soon. Thanks, Gary. Yep. Bye-bye.